Sebastian, you've mentioned before that you had a love affair with Risk. Where does this currently stand? Well, uh, Risk is still a very appealing thing for a lot of people. Uh, it seems to um, it seems to increase your appreciation of the moment and of life in general, and uh, it, it enhances a lot of things. But it also occasionally comes at a cost. And for me, that cost caught up with me in 2011 when my good friend Tim Hetherington was killed in Libya in combat. Um, he was killed on an assignment that I was supposed to be on with him in the last minute and I couldn't go. And uh, he died and I was left feeling tremendously guilty and also keenly aware of the fact that when you risk your life in war or anywhere else, um, it feels like you're just risking something of yours, your own life, and actually what you're putting at risk is the emotional welfare of everyone you love. And I watched the, the consequences of Tim's death ripple out through his community in the most devastating ways, and I just thought, whatever the upside of risk is personally, it's not worth the potential downside to everyone I care about, and I, I mean, literally within an hour of finding out that Tim had died, I, I decided to stop covering war. Well, you've also said that covering war and being in combat blows out your levels. And I thought that was a very interesting way to put it, that normal life, quote unquote, is really never the same. So once that hour decision came down, how was it for you to assimilate back into normal I, life? I, I, the expo exposure to risk absolutely does blow out your levels and it makes everything else look pretty dull and meaningless. Um, I think mean, the feeling of meaningfulness comes from feeling that there's consequences to things. And the greater the consequences are, the more meaning something seems to have. And the, the ultimate consequences are life and death. And so in a combat situation, everything seems incredibly meaningful because the con enormous consequences are everywhere. Uh, and then you come back to, you know, your suburban home in America and Nothing seems very meaningful because the consequences, we've made a society where consequences are kept to a minimum, which is great, except that it feels meaningless. And um, I think the trick to living happily in that kind of situation um, is to find other kinds of, other kinds of meaning. Um, you know, a walk in the park with your child is very meaningful, but there's no risk involved. There's no consequences really involved. And I think it's a matter of maturing, of maturity, to grow out of a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old mindset about excitement and risk and consequence into something a little bit more profound. And for me, I, I, um, I don't know if I'm late or early, but I started that process in my late 40s. And I'm getting there. And, I, and actually, you know, I think I have a, a, it's a certainly less exciting life, but I think I have a much richer life, emotionally richer life, than I ever could have had jetting off to war zones and coming back all cranked with adrenaline. Well, I know the word courage is a huge thing for you. And then you said that the word has changed. It's evolved. What did courage initially mean to you and how has it manifested? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, soldiers don't even like the word courage. In their opinion, there's soldiers and there's cowards. But the word courageous soldier, the phrase courageous soldier is completely redundant. They're one and the same thing in, in the minds of soldiers. Um, I think there's a kind of raw physical courage uh, in combat or in other situations. I think young men are wired for that and quite good at it. Um, I think that's all a product of evolution and I think our species depended on, um, depended on something like that in its young men. Um, you can see the same behavior in primates also. It's very clear this is, you know, so it came from an evolutionary past. But I think there's other, there's other forms of courage as well. Um, there's moral courage, there's political courage. And I think, um, you know, basically courage, courage means standing for an ideal, for a principle, regardless of the consequences. Um, there was an amazing study done uh, about comparing courage between men and women, men typically, their courage takes the form of physically taking action, running into the burning building, jumping into the surf to chase, save the child, protecting their girlfriend from bullets in a theater where someone's shooting at them, that kind of thing. Women actually don't do that very much. Um, certainly not if there's men around. 
they, they, well, they let the men do it, and well, they should. Where women's courage comes into play is, is it really moral courage? And during World War II, there were, um, there were people in Europe who were not Jewish, right? They were not in danger from the Nazis, and they would hide Jewish families in their basements or whatever, things that would absolutely get their whole, get them killed if the Germans found out about it. And often it was women, the female heads of households, not the men who were insisting on these things. It was a real moral courage that men actually are a little bit more ambivalent about. So there's, I mean, we're an incredible species, right, humans, and there's, um, those two very important forms of courage, they seem to be divided a little bit by gender. And I think both are necessary for a um, safe and civil society, actually. If another filmmaker wanted to emulate what you and Tim Hetherington have done with these two films, what would you advise to them? I think in order to repeat what Tim and I did, you have to, you would, a filmmaker would have to understand first and foremost that documentary film is journalism. It's not a vehicle for your opinions. It's not a public service announcement. It's not a commentary on the war or on anything else. It's a documentary. It's documenting reality. And if you go into that situation, any situation, with a real neutrality, um, people pick up on that and they respect it and they'll talk to you. And the only thing Tim and I were interested in was in the physical and emotional reality of combat. And other great journalists were evaluating the war and having a political discussion and all that, very important. Tim and I were not doing that. And if you want to do, if you as a filmmaker would want to duplicate what Tim and I did, you would have to find that place in yourself where you're really not judging, you're just trying to understand. It's hard to do. But um, I think it's a crucial part of the... Um, it's a, a crucial part of the work done by the media, is to under, just understand in basic reality terms what some people are going through. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Oh.